We talked to dozens and dozens of SEALs for this project, and I just think you can't underestimate the amount of moral stress and strain that they have been enduring over the past 20 years. And part of that is frustrating on another level because it's all basically happening in secret, that basically after 9-11, we decided that we were going to fight wars on the whole covertly, and that the SEALs and other special operators were going to become the tip of the spear, and they were sent out on manhunting missions to get members of al-Qaeda and enemy Iraqis and enemy combatants, and as one SEAL put it, that they were killing people so close you could smell their bad breath before they did it. Hello, and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. You know, the phrase war crime or war crimes or war criminal packs a very profound, specific moral punch for a reason, right? I think a lot of that grows out of the wake of World War II, honestly, and the Nuremberg trials and the sort of recognition of the ghastliness, the the sort of sheer evil of what the Nazis had done. But of course, like laws of war extend before then, and there has been this long wrestling among sort of international legal theorists and generals and military leaders in different countries and different places to essentially try to civilize war, right? To to, to draw these distinctions between things you can and cannot do even when you are engaged in the act of killing and violence and destruction. And You know, I think there's a certain kind of radical critique of that literature and that development that says all war is a crime and this is a way of sort of dressing it up and and making it seem safe for consumption or it's a way of making uncivilized barbarity and brutality seem like fine and civilized and something that nations can do. But there's also a way in which I think, particularly in the wake of World War II, the distinctions between, you know, soldiers engaging on a battlefield and, you know, the torture and murder of people seems like a really important moral salient one. And, you know, the U.S. has committed war crimes. This is something that Ilhan Omar (laughs) got in a lot of trouble for saying, but that's just like an absolute fact. Um, It's happened in my lifetime multiple times. There have been war crimes committed in Afghanistan. Torture was a war crime. The torture, the waterboarding that we engaged in was a war crime, even if we said it wasn't because it wasn't technically torture. And there was a very prominent case recently of an accusation of a war crime against a man named Eddie Gallagher, who is a chief petty officer, a Navy SEAL, who, with his Navy SEAL team, took captive a 17-year-old ISIS fighter in Mosul and posed with him uh, with his corpse. He was accused of stabbing him to death, of murdering him, and then posing with the corpse. He was tried and, in a sort of remarkable turn of events, which we'll talk about, acquitted on the murder but convicted of the crime of posing with the corpse. And he was then subsequently pardoned by Donald Trump and became a kind of right-wing cause celeb. And I remember reading about the case and following pretty closely, and the thing that was most striking was the fact that the people that turned him in were the people on that Navy team. The, the warriors that fought with him. And I remember thinking, wow, it must have really freaked them out to do that because obviously there's incredibly intense camaraderie. There's also like a definitely pretty strong no-snitching norm, uh, I think, in, in combat units like that. And so I remember thinking, wow, this guy must have really been off the rails. But the story sort of floated at the periphery of the news, and I always kind of wanted to dig deeper into it. And so I was super psyched when I saw that the very, very excellent podcast host and producer Dan Taberski had a new podcast out about the case called The Line. It's on Apple Original Podcast. It's out now. It's really excellent. And I would suggest that after you listen to this interview, you go listen to all the episodes. We're going to just sort of touch on some of it, but it's really well produced, really well reported, tons of great interviews and voices in there. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Dan Taberski to Why Is This Happening? Hey, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Dan, tell me how you got into this story. This is actually the first podcast project that I ever made that was not my original idea. My first one was a podcast called Missing Richard Simmons about uh, what happened to Richard Simmons when he stepped out of the spotlight in 2017. I did a couple others, including one last year called Running From Cops. That's great, by the way. Thank you. People should check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Missing Missing Richard Simmons is really great, too, I should say. I've I've listened to both of those. Uh, Good. Thank you. Wait one second. Tell us what Running From Cops is because it's a really 
a great, important yeah. podcast. Running from Cops is basically an investigation into the show, reality show Cops, and how it's influenced our perception of policing in America. And it came from my own sort of, I don't want to say obsession, but I've seen, I, I estimate I've seen maybe 500 episodes of the show of Cops, even before we started reporting the podcast. That show, at tw- at the age of 11, yeah. that show would come on and I thought, how is this legal? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember thinking it like at the time, like, bad boys, bad boys. Yeah, what you? It's what's do? so fascinating about it. It's like, wh- how how are they doing this? They're just blurring their faces, but like this this doesn't seem okay. This seems like really v- exploitative and wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but also fascinating. And so we watched, and analyzed 842 episodes of the show. It's been on for 30 years, and we found the people who are you know the quote unquote perps uh, who end up on the show and. Why would they end up signing a release? Uh, and do they sign releases? And and just sort of what does it do to policing in this country? So that was an amazing, amazing dive. I resurfaced with a real different perspective. And then how did this, uh, the line come about? I was approached by Alex Gibney and Apple. It was going to be their first original podcast. And it was sort of a combined project that they were going to do a, a filmed version of it, a documentary version of it. And then they wanted to do a podcast at the same time, not as a companion, but two sort of separately reported projects. And so I just sort of spent a month going back into the case and just reading, trying to decide if I wanted to do it and just became fascinated. The case was interesting in itself. I mean, just the facts alone and the sort of twists and turns uh, were enough to go on. But, But I was actually more interested in the idea of, of the reactions to the story in that basically there was two reactions or two two polls. On the one side is most people I know, like Eddie Gallagher monster. Like he's, he, Eddie Gallagher is 100% a war criminal. He's a monster. Look at what he did. Like no, no sort of acknowledgement that it might be a really complicated situation when you're in the middle of clearing Mosul of ISIS and that all the sort of things that go along with, with combat um, make it much more complex than just guilty or not guilty. So that's the one side. And then the other side was – Not only is he not guilty, but people were saying, does it really matter if he did it to begin with? Like, does it really matter if the good guys cross the line? And I just found those two reactions both fascinating. Well, and I would say on that, there's even a stronger version of the latter reaction, which is that, like, he's a hero who has been sabotaged by his own government. You know what I mean? Like, that he is being persecuted for killing the bad guys the way that we want our warriors to kill them. Yes, and that it's all about that we're sort of bothering him with the niggling details of, of of how he kills the ISIS guys, even though that's why he was was sent there ostensibly. So, yeah, absolutely. Which, again, comes back to this sort of point, which is one that you explore in the podcast and even the title of it, of like, I kept coming back to this idea about how a certain leftist and radical critique of the notion of war crimes and this this sort of attempt to civilize or cleanse war of its brutality ends up in synthesis with a certain right-wing idea that like war is war and warriors do what they have to do to like protect the flock. And they kind of converge on this same sort of point, which is that these rules are ridiculous. And then you have people operating in this space who really think the rules matter a lot, even though they themselves are like, yes, I kill for a living. That's what I do. Right. And nobody's sort of acknowledging the possibility that maybe the rules, maybe the line, maybe maybe the sort of the, the things that we do to define the difference between right and wrong, it's not there because of the Geneva Conventions. That's a good reason, but it's also there to protect the mental and moral health yes. of the people who have to do that fighting, that those rules are there so that they can live with what it is that we ask them to do as they're doing it. Yeah, this is the notion of moral injury, which there's lots of incredible research about how a huge driver of PTSD is not being on the on the receiving end of violence, but being the com- but committing it. And that moral injury, yeah. which is the term for that, which is that people actually humans don't like killing. Yeah. yeah, and it's hard actually to get them to kill. And there's this incredible study after World War II about the number of soldiers that don't fire their their guns. Yeah, incredible. And that you have to create the conditions in which they can and essentially live with themselves. Yes, it is a process. It is a process that takes a long time to get people to to be able to do it, not just once, but to do it over and over. And of course, this was a huge experiment going to the war on terror because we've been fighting for 20 years. And that's what's been happening with the SEALs is that, yes, you can do it perhaps in World War II for, you know, six-month deployment and then go back to your family or, you know, maybe after three years the war is over and we all go back to normal. But what happens when you ask people to kill over and over for 20 years? What does that do to their moral health? So let's talk about the case a little bit, just the details. 
the SEAL team that Gallagher is with is engaged in this really brutal, close combat of clearing ISIS out of Mosul. Yeah. Is it 2017? Is that right? Yeah, it's in 2017. We've actually done a podcast on just a book about that fight. (laughs) Really? Yeah. And just because like it's some of the most brutal urban combat that's yeah. basically happened since World War II. It's like, I mean, block by block clearing like really, yeah, really, yeah. really brutal combat, right? Yeah, really intensely brutal. And also, you know, mixed in with civilians. So it's not an empty city. It's got, you know, hundreds of thousands of people of Iraqis who live in Mosul. And then it's got like, you know, a few thousand ISIS fighters who are controlling the city and are ostensibly holding it hostage. And so you're not just fighting block by block. You can't just nuke the whole city. You have to be able to separate between who's the bad guy and who are the good guys, or at least who's being held hostage. And it's just, it's very murky from the get-go. And so what happens on the day in question? The day in question is May 3rd, 2017, and they do a signet airstrike on a safe house in Mosul, in the West Bank of Mosul, in Old West Mosul, where 10 ISIS fighters are hiding out. The Alpha Platoon of SEAL Team 7 is fighting alongside the ERD, the Iraqi ERD, which is basically our partner force. And they do a signet strike. Five of the men die, four escape. One ISIS fighter is captured. We believe he's injured. Uh, He probably has blast lung. He has a wound to the leg, but he's alive. And the Iraqi ERD bring him to the seals of Alpha Platoon. Eddie Gallagher is a medic. There's two other medics in the platoon. They begin to treat him, and the helmet cam that is rolling, many of the seals wear helmet cams uh, so they can record what they're doing if they want to. The helmet cam gets turned off. So the last image we're left with is Eddie Gallagher kneeling over this ISIS fighter. And then the next image we see from that day is a still photograph of Eddie Gallagher with a hunting knife in one hand and the corpse of that ISIS fighter in the other. And the SEALs in the platoon say that he stabbed that fighter and and basically killed a prisoner of war. He denies it. But the image we know exists, right? Like, that's not debatable. That is not debatable. Yeah, I've seen it. I've looked at it ad nauseum. Uh, It's it's pretty gruesome and hard to look at outside the context of war, even inside the context of war, I'm sure. But it's, it's particularly dehumanizing when you look at it from outside. How do the allegations first start to emerge? And there's incredibly fascinating kind of social dynamics among these guys who are very, I think, like, let's say traditionally macho, very battle-hardened, very tight-knit, Yeah. also really furious and freaked out by what they say they saw of Gallagher do. Yeah, I mean— it depends on who you believe in terms of how the allegations came to light. I mean, at least two of the of the men in the platoon say they told somebody right away, that they told the officer in charge right away what they say Gallagher had done and that nothing was done about it. But basically what happens is that they get back to the States in September of 2017, and over the next several months, uh, a group of the SEALs convince themselves over text messages that they need to go and tell somebody. They they just keep banging on doors at the SEAL teams until somebody takes them seriously, and then NCIS takes over, and it takes over from there. 19 of the 21 platoon members go in and speak with NCIS and tell them what they saw. Not all of them say they saw a, a stabbing. I believe there's three people who say they were eyewitnesses to the stabbing. But then it just balloons into this larger conversation about what else Gallagher was doing on that deployment as the chief of that platoon, what what he was doing in terms of allegedly shooting civilians and uh, basically, you know, uh, trying to get his his kill on. Yeah, we'll we'll talk a little bit about that, about what their sort of conception of Gallagher is and what Gallagher's lawyer and, and the people who are defending him say was motivating this. I mean, right, So because at one level you think to yourself, I mean, just again, as someone who saw the story from the periphery, right? It's a little like when a woman comes forward to accuse like a famous person of like a sexual assault, right? Yeah, yeah. And you're like, my sort of baseline, particularly if it's someone who's like fairly anonymous and has a lot to lose, my baseline is like, there's really nothing to be gained (laughs) for this woman to come forward and make this accusation. It doesn't mean that the accusation is true. It just means that like, as I evaluate how I think about this, the background context for me is that like, this person has risked a tremendous amount to make this accusation. And that was the way that I felt about these seals in the platoon. Like, it just seemed that, man, something happened or something was animating for them to come forward and to try to get someone to listen as long as they did. It wasn't like it immediately snowballed. 
Yeah, I mean, I wasn't a believer of it in the beginning, and after spending so much time on the case and talking to the people involved, I'm still extremely skeptical of the Gallagher and the Gallagher attorney argument that they made it all up, that these SEALs came out and basically made up these allegations against Eddie Gallagher, their chief, because uh, he was pushing them too hard in combat, that he was making them do things that they didn't want to do, and uh, and that this was their revenge. The, the sort of logic to it ne- never quite it holds up. Uh, it doesn't mean it's true, like you said, but but I, I don't quite buy that. You know, there, there are enormous informer social penalties for doing what they do. I mean, it's absolutely unheard of to come and not only dime out on another seal, but to dime out on your chief and to have not just one, not just two, but seven testify against him in court. That's not even the people who have said things about him to NCIS. That is people who actually testified in court. It's pretty miraculous that it got that far. And and anytime uh, a, a community that insular and that self-protective and that and where loyalty is that is that important to them does something like that, I think you do need to take it seriously. Talk a little bit about the picture that they end up portraying about Gallagher more broadly and his conduct in theater. Yeah, I mean, when they arrived in Mosul, I mean, they all say that he was somebody that they really looked up to. They used the word stud over and over, like they really see him as a specimen of what a model SEAL should be in terms physically and courageously. Uh, This is his eighth deployment and his first as a chief. He's a senior enlisted man in this platoon, right? Correct. Talk a little bit about just before continuing like that role in combat, because it's a very specific and I think important one to kind of understand. Yeah. So basically, a SEAL team is divided. They they will have, there's officers and, then, and there's enlisted. And a SEAL team basically has six platoons. In the platoon, there's a, a chief who is the enlisted guy. That's Eddie Gallagher in this case. And there's also an officer, an officer in charge. So there's sort of a dual system. The officer is obviously the more sort of formal administrative one, but it is really the chief, the enlisted guy, the guy who has been doing the fighting and who rises to that level of leading the platoon. That is the one who is who is informally in charge of the behavior of those SEALs. I I think it's fair to say. So, yeah, like if you've seen Ted Lasso, I think that's where, if you've seen Ted Lasso, like there's Ted Lasso and then there's his assistant coach and assistant coach is kind of like closer to the team and is the one that like barks at them to do drills and get it on and off the field. And in some ways, that's kind of the role of that that chief petty officer. Uh, Yeah, I think that's an apt uh, comparison, but I would add to that that, Somebody like Gallagher in a platoon, especially has been doing it for that long, they become, I mean, there's only 2,500 SEALs, so they become sort of SEAL famous. And right. there is hero worship, for sure, going into this thing. Yeah. And, I, and I will say also with the teams, like, you you will be amazed. We, we talked to over 50 SEALs and special operators for this, and you'll be amazed at how often you hear them use words related to family. Like, they, they say, I was raised by the teams, right. or I was brought up in the teams. Like, the relationships are are sincere, and that role of the chief is, yeah, that guy's he's he's in charge. Well, and he also, I mean, he's also fighting alongside you, yeah. right? Like, it's, I mean, he's, he, he's in there. He's on the field, as it were. And to your point about eight deployments, like, again, it's not, you know, it's not World War II where people went and they they saw a lot of combat for four years. Eight deployments, like this is a group of people who have been in many different parts of the world. They might have mm-hmm. been in really, really sticky situations, really terrifying situations over long, iterated periods of time. I mean, years and years yeah. that these special operators have been deployed. Yeah, and for the most part, like, the the guys in the platoon were much less experienced than Eddie Gallagher. I mean, Eddie Gallagher had been doing this for a long time. And it's not like be working in a factory and someone knows how to operate the machine. It's like it's like somebody who knows how to keep alive in these situations. Yeah. It, it is an important role, and, and he had a breadth of experience that was above and beyond almost everybody in that platoon. And so when we say he's he's a specimen, and we, we should say that he is very, like, I would say conventionally handsome. He's got this square jaw. He's in, like, incredible shape. He very much looks like a movie version of a Navy SEAL, for lack of a better description, yeah, right? Yeah, short. <laughs> short. Yes, short also. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, for sure. Like, he, he looks the part. And so they get there, and he's sort of SEAL famous. And then what's the story you hear from them? You t- I mean, talk about this on the podcast. I forget which episode it is. But, yeah. but like the the kind of, you know, the change in the way they think of him. You know, 
the picture changes for them when they essentially get to Mosul. Many of them say that small things, like he starts separating himself from the group, things like uh, he starts stealing things from other from other platoon mates, but like small things, like stuff from care packages or like the magazine from their gun. And then it becomes more and more concerning where he isn't even given a rifle. He's trained as a sniper, but he's not issued a rifle. He starts taking other people's rifles so that he can snipe. And then some of them say that it felt like they just became his sniper escort, where they would cart him around to different sniper perches around Mosul so that he could shoot and try to kill ISIS fighters. And then it becomes more that uh, that he's also shooting civilians as well. And and that's where, obviously, it starts to get really hairy And that it's a situation where the SEALs in the platoon say that they feel like it is out of control, that they can't stop his behavior. Nobody will listen to what they're saying about his behavior. So then they find themselves in a situation where they feel the burden to try to mitigate his behavior informally, doing things like not giving him the air density cards that they would normally give a sniper to sort of dial in a shot. Like, they don't give it to him so that his shot won't work. There's accusations that they tamper with his gun, Um, doing things to try to keep him from shooting civilians, which is what some of the SEALs in the platoon say that he was doing. Uh, And then then the the incident on May 3rd is the thing that really puts it over the edge. And it's also a very up-close and personal interaction with an ISIS fighter. Whereas they would be seeing them through their sniper scope, now this fighter is here, they can see this person, and he is a kid, he's a boy. He's a very young-looking 17-year-old. And it just becomes way more personal, and, and it just starts to, I think it's fair to say, feel a lot more more like murder. Again, Gallagher denies this, so I want to be, just be clear. 100%, yeah. 100% by that, this is not like what we're saying is not like this is the truth of what happened. This is the picture of what these men say happened. But but just yes. to put a little finer point on it, like the picture that comes across is that like something happens where he gets like he develops a kind of compulsion to kill. That is what they describe, yes. That, like, that what they're describing, again, that he denies this, but what they're describing is someone who's, like, become kind of sickly addicted to this. Yes. To the point where it almost sounds like people intervening with a friend who's an addict. Yes. Like, taking the drugs away, right? Like, that they're, like, trying all these different ways to wean him or get him away from his compulsion. Yes. And also, just to remind you, like, he's the chief. So as one SEAL put it to us, he said, what were we supposed to do? Tackle him to the ground? Like, on the one hand, there are informal ways to do this, but he's also in charge. He's your boss. And so there's only so much you can do in terms of stopping behavior that you think is wrong because he's the one that you would report it to. Tell me what the the SEALs who say they saw directly what happened that day, what they say happened. Uh, The ISIS fighter is lying on the ground. Uh, He's about 17 years old. They think he has blast lung and a wound to the leg. Gallagher begins treating him. He's trained as a medic, and there's two other medics on the scene. They do things like put uh, a patent airway, uh, a a chest tube to to sort of de-inflate the lungs, uh, to relieve pressure from the lungs. They bandage up his wounds. There are three SEALs that say they saw Eddie Gallagher after all these sort of treatments were done to stabilize the patient. They, They say that Eddie Gallagher took out a hunting knife. It's a custom-made hunting knife with a a three-inch fixed blade that he had specially made before he went out into Mosul. Uh, He ostensibly carried it around with him. And he took out that knife and stabbed uh, that detainee twice in the neck. And then the prisoner died. There's video of the prisoner because there's video of that GoPro and helmet cam before it gets turned off. You you describe is got the sort of wisp of a kind of pubescent muscle. I mean, this is not, just to be clear, not that it would make it okay if this were like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi to to stab someone who's captured. But just to be clear, like this is essentially a kid who signed up to fight for ISIS for money as best we can understand. Yeah, it's hard to tell because we're we're not convinced that we actually know who the person is. We 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 narrowed right. it down to two. We couldn't narrow it down to my sort of satisfaction any further. So, but yeah, these are young young people, and now you know, defenseless, yeah. in and out of consciousness, no weapon, yeah. surrounded by Navy SEALs. So it's not a situation where they're in danger. So they say that they reported this immediately. That that they had to knock on a bunch of doors. They come back from deployment. They're on this text chain. They they eventually get someone to listen, and this investigation starts. When does he get charged? 
he's ultimately arrested on September 11th of 2018. He's actually at a traumatic brain injury clinic at the time called the Intrepid Center. Uh, a lot of SEALs have issues like that after they get out of the teams. And he's arrested in September of 2018. At what point does he become this kind of cause celeb? You know, that's when his wife intervenes. They kept it on the down low for a while, and then basically his wife, Andrea Gallagher, who has a background in branding, decides that they're going to go public. She thinks that he's not getting a fair shake, that the Navy is out to get him and to and to prosecute him and put him in prison as an example of, oh, look at us prosecuting war crimes. And she goes public, and she basically uh, goes public with conservative media and paints it at him as innocent and also paints the seals that dined out on him as being sort of disgruntled millennials who say that they disagreed with his tactics, that he put them in danger, and that this is their way for revenge. It's like this whole, like, he's a tough, older, they're like snowflakes. Yeah. They, I mean, it's so crazy because it's like, these are Navy yeah. seals, right? But like the same, it's it inscribes the same thing you hear about like college professors teaching the young and the woke a yeah. little bit. Like that's a little bit of the story she tells, which is that this is a hard-driven guy who's battle-hardened and driving them hard, which is his job yeah. as a warrior, and they can't take it, and this is how they get their revenge. Yes, but it works. I mean, they raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for his defense. He gets Bernie Carrick, who was a former Homeland Security nominee and the former uh, New York City chief of police. Uh, he gets him on his side. He gets one of, one of Donald Trump's lawyers, becomes one of his lawyers. Like, he gets heavy hitter attorneys because of this narrative. I mean, it, it really works in terms of getting the Fox and Friends and then the Trump sort of world to pay attention to what's happening. Um, Peter Hegseth is another one who becomes a very outspoken advocate for him. He's a Princeton grad and veteran who's on Fox and Friends. Okay, so the trial's going forward. He becomes this very sort of public case, right? Um, there's this very concerted effort to raise money and to raise awareness on his behalf as a uh, railroaded, you know, victim of, you know, snowflakes, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, basically. Then he goes to trial, and I want to talk about the trial and something Shocking happens at that trial. Let's talk about that right after we take this quick break. So this is not a civilian trial, right, that he's facing, right? This is a court-martial. Yeah, this is this is a military trial, so it's it's different. There's not 12 people on, on the jury. There's seven, and they're all military. And there's actually one SEAL. So there's, like, little differences. But in general, it, it has the texture of a trial. And some of the SEALs who have made these complaints testify. Mm -hmm. And there's one star witness or one witness who is called to the stand and the expectation is that he will say that Gallagher killed this prisoner. Yes. He had testified. His name is Corey Scott. He was another medic in the platoon. He had made statements to NCIS multiple times and to investigators that he saw Gallagher stab that prisoner. And that was his story going forward multiple times. He gets on the stand and he says, Eddie Gallagher didn't kill him. I killed him. He says, I put my thumb over the breathing tube and I'm the one who killed that prisoner, not Eddie Gallagher. Now, he has never said this before. He's never said it before publicly, for sure. He may have said it to his attorney, but as far as any legal documents go, there was questions about, is he sort of like dialing down his testimony before he gets on? But I mean, he's called as a prosecution witness. They they bring him up there and they think he's going to say that Eddie Gallagher killed him. And, right, and they have reason to think that because he told investigators that. The other question is, did anyone else say that Corey Scott had been the person to kill this prisoner? No, no, no. I mean, this is like this is like a straight up like le legal drama moment, right? Like this doesn't really happen very often in trials. This is a shocking moment in the courtroom. Yeah, because normally it would get to the point where if somebody changes their story. They're not going to wait until they're going to get up on the stand and do it. There's multiple opportunities to sort of get out of it before you're actually sitting there under oath. And also to implicate yourself on the stand. <laughs> yeah, and to implicate yourself on the stand. It's, it's pretty remarkable. You know, there are lots of theories as to the veracity of what he said or why he would say it. But that's what happened. And it was an absolute shocker. Even Gallagher himself says he didn't know it was going to happen. So what what do we make of that? <laughs> Well, there's potentially a couple things going on. Um, one theory is that is that Corey Scott had spent many months, him and his attorney, trying to get testimonial immunity so that he could go on the stand and couldn't be prosecuted for what he said. 
and that once he had that, he was free to say what he wanted. So that could be because he had always known that he killed that prisoner and that he just wanted to be able to get on the on the stand and say it, and that was the only way right. he could do it. Or he was trying to get testimony immunity so that he could protect his chief and say that I killed him, he didn't kill him, and you can't me. prosecute me. Exactly. Right. So there's two ways, right? Two interpretations is yeah. he's confessing yeah. in reality yeah. and has has sort of somewhat brilliantly yeah. s- steered things such that he could confess and tell the truth, exculpate his chief, and also not be prosecuted. Correct. The other theory is that he is lying to protect his chief and, again, has has either steered himself into this position or someone has sort of gotten to him to convince him to do this late. Correct. And and we do know that Corey Scott did go and see Gallagher. And remember, Corey Scott was going to be a prosecution witness. Like, he and Gallagher are not buddy-buddy. It is an adversarial relationship. There is, we, we do know that he went to see Gallagher when he was in the brig, and it was a 20-minute meeting with him and their attorneys, and nobody knows what was said besides them. Wow. But it's something else to remember, which makes it even more confounding, is that Corey Scott testified to all this, saying that he killed him, not Eddie Gallagher. Corey Scott also said said that Eddie Gallagher 100% stabbed that detainee. And so that which doesn't protect his chief, which implicates his chief. So it becomes complicated in terms of trying to suss out what he was really doing. There. Wait, you're saying that in the same testimony, he says that the, the stabbing wasn't the cause of death because yes. Corey had already killed him, but that he Correct. did stab him. His testimony was that Eddie Gallagher stabbed that detainee. Before that detainee died, I put my thumb over the breathing tube and that is what killed him. And to compound it further, which just shows how complicated these sort of military situations are, to compound it further, he says that he did it because he was protecting uh, that detainee from what would have happened to him when he woke up, which is the Iraqi ERD, our partner forces, who have been documented war criminals and who we were working with anyway, would have killed him that the SEALs had been sharing a building with the Iraqi ERD and that they could hear the torture at night. They would see people go in and not come out. They would hear men being electrocuted, ISIS prisoners being electrocuted by the Iraqi ERD. So Corey Scott knew that this is most likely what would have happened to him anyway. Uh, And so, A, you could look at it as a mercy killing, but B, you could also look at it as the irony is just so profound that Corey Scott would have been responsible for putting his chief in prison for a war crime that ostensibly would have happened anyway a few hours later by the people that we were working with. And that is where the conversation about the line comes in. It's like, how do you know what to do in that situation? How do you know what to do? Just to be clear, Scott says that Gallagher stabs him first and then he puts the finger over the breathing tube? Correct. Right. And so he is basic, right, that he is the cause of death, but that Gallagher had stabbed him, A, yes. and B, that that his motivation for this was not some sick thrill, was like in the moment, yes. this guy is this incredibly wounded kid who is about to get transferred over to essentially the torture cops yes. next door yeah. who are going to electrocute him. And that, and that that was the decision he made in the moment. It's chilling. There are so many feelings about this trial and who's right and who's wrong, but all I can do at that part of the story is feel for Corey Scott and just how confounding that sort of crossroads was for him. And we don't have reason to think that Scott was viewed by members of his platoon the way Gallagher was, like this was a guy who was going around, you know, that others saw as a loose cannon or someone with like a real bloodthirst. Uh, Corey Scott, absolutely not, no. So Gallagher's acquitted of the murder charge. Correct. There's seven charges. Uh, he's acquitted of the stabbing the detainee. He's acquitted of the attempted murder of two separate cases of shooting civilians. Which, by the way, are a little less conclude. Like, you don't have some dramatic testimony that actually pays them there. They just don't find him guilty. No, the testimony against Gallagher there is quite dramatic. But, there, but in my opinion, there's just not enough evidence. Yeah. There's no physical evidence. There's no bodies. It's their word against his. And, and so those were definitely on shakier legal ground, those, those charges. Okay, but he is convicted of some of the charges. He's convicted of one charge, taking a photograph with the corpse. That, I believe, falls under the umbrella of conduct unbecoming. Right. And then what happens afterwards? He goes and he gets a tattoo of his wife's face in front of an American flag on his forearm. And he moves on to life as a post-seal, trying to decide how he's going to, you know, move forward. 
but then he ends up getting pardoned. See, this is so interesting. Eddie Gallagher wasn't pardoned. After he was charged, after he was declared guilty, his sentence was uh, a little bit of prison time, time served, and it was a reduction in rank. Right. And what Trump did is not reverse the guilty charge. The guilty charge still stands. What he did was reverse the right. sentencing and reinstate his his chiefiness. The key thing, though, is 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 the reinstatement, right? That, like, he had lost his trident, like— he had been demoted essentially, and like obviously in the world of the of the seal famous, I mean in this world, like that matters tremendously. <laughs> it matters tremendously, although I find it interesting because it was such a scorched earth media campaign that they did in order to save him in the first place that I don't feel that the seals Eddie Gallagher doesn't really have sort of a traditional place in the seals anymore. I think it's fair to say. Huh. I think some seals support him, and I think many, many don't. Well, how could you not be a polarizing figure after yeah. this whole thing? I mean, 100%. And he will be that for the rest of his life. But, you know, it, it also had to do with the pride of, of saying that he was a SEAL and, and that he was a SEAL chief. And it also has to do with basics like the reduction in rank would have cost him a lot of money. Money. Yeah, right. But then the, the reinstatement causes another reaction with, with the Secretary of the Navy. Yeah, the Secretary of the Navy says, oh, wait a minute. And then, I mean, basically, it's it's all a bunch of little moves of people trying to do the sort of drastic, dramatic things that Trump wants to do in a sort of milder, more conforming sort of way, which, of course, drives Trump crazy. Uh, the Secretary of the Navy quits. Or uh, he's, I don't know if he was fired. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure well, he's... Well, he, he issues a letter of resign, whatever he does. He might be fired, yeah. but he issues a letter saying, here's... Basically saying this was this was messed up. hundred percent. I mean, he Trump intervened in that case earlier when he basically got Eddie Gallagher let out of the brig because his wife went on Fox and Friends and said, let my husband out of the brig. He's innocent. And Trump tweeted that he's released from the brig. And then it just created this whole atmosphere where everybody who was a potential juror, the prosecution, the defense, everybody knew that, that Trump was watching. And that you just can't deny that that would change the tenor of a trial. What was your most sort of surprising thing that you came away from this very, very intense and immersive reporting project with? Uh, you know, we talked to dozens and dozens of SEALs for this project, and I just think you can't underestimate the amount of moral stress and strain that they have been enduring over the past 20 years. And Part of that is frustrating on another level because it's all basically happening in secret. That basically after 9-11, we decided that we were going to fight wars on the whole covertly and that the SEALs and other special operators were going to become the tip of the spear. And they were sent out on manhunting missions to get members of al-Qaeda and enemy Iraqis and enemy combatants. And as one SEAL put it, that they were killing people so close you could smell their bad breath before they did it. It is a different kind of warfare than World War II. It is not battalions. It is not front lines. It is not traditional. And I think that the military is operating on the assumption that these guys can kill like this for years and years and years and not have it affect them. And I think it very clearly is. And then the second thing that I think was shocking to me is that we were able to get unredacted courtroom audio of the trial. And what my big takeaway from that trial was how culpable the government was and we as the people who send these guys to fight, how part of the system we are in terms of graying the lines, in terms of blurring the lines with, in, under which they fight. You know, for example, these guys weren't supposed to be in combat at any, in the first place. They were sent under the AAA program. It's basically, they call it AAA, advise, assist, and accompany. So basically, it's like, we're going to send the SEALs over to help them in Mosul, but they're not fighting. They're not in combat. They're just there to advise. These guys were in combat every day. These guys were in combat every day. And we learned this from the trial, from the testimony of the people who, who were organizing that fight. They were supposed to maintain a certain distance from the front lines. They would regularly turn their GPS trackers off so that, that, that they could get closer. They were in combat constantly. And I find that, A, it's duplicitous, but B, it's also very frustrating to know that people are uh, experiencing these things and not receiving sort of public support that you would normally expect if we were in World War II and like keep the home fires burning and it's all happening in secret. And so they're actually not getting support from the public that they would ostensibly need. And the other thing is that fact that we were working with 
war criminals that we had decided to work with the Iraqi ERD. The United States had been blacklisted by the Leahy legislation in 2015 from working with the Iraqi ERDs because of the war crimes that they have been documented committing. And we decided to work with them anyway to clear Mosul. And that may have been a good thing. I mean, maybe ISIS was worse than working with the Iraqi ERD. But I think you can't underestimate how confusing that is to be working, sharing a building with war criminals, and it's okay for them, but it's not okay for you, and you can see how that would get confusing. So just our responsibility in it, I think, was pretty eye-opening for me. Dan Taberski hosts the investigative miniseries podcast, The Line, which you should go just check out right now. We, We sort of talked about it and the topic, but hearing the voices of these people, hearing the reporting, hearing the audio from the trial is all really great. It's an incredibly well done piece of work. Dan, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Once again, great thanks to Dan Taberski. The podcast is called The Line. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Tweet us with the hashtag withpod. Email us at withpod at gmail.com. We truly do love to hear from you. Why is this happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In team and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening. 